Good morning, Scowlin Baptist Church. We are filming today. We, we had a uh, little technical difficulty with our live stream this past Sunday, and we didn't want you guys to, to be behind or miss out on, on our uh, time together in God's Word this week. So I hope you'll be able to kind of catch up and be able to watch this at some point this week uh, and be able to kind of continue our study through the book of Genesis together. So uh, if you have a Bible, uh, open with me to chapter 35 uh, in your Bible. We're going to be looking at chapter 35 this morning. Uh, the, uh, the backdrop to this story was two weeks ago. Alex shared a little bit uh, from chapter 34, and he talked about uh, you know, this, just a godless picture, uh, how Jacob's family was, things were not going well with Jacob's family. Uh, Dina had been abused, and, and uh, the res- result of that was that uh, her brothers, Jacob's sons, took vengeance upon uh, these, these men who were, uh, who were the abusers of, their sis- of, of the Jacob's son's sister. And so it was just bad. Uh, a lot of bad things were going on, and uh, uh, that was two weeks ago that we talked about that. This past week, we took the Lord's Supper. We talked about missional living, and, uh, and the thing that kind of stuck out to me uh, during that, that time together particularly the Lord's Supper, was, was recommitment, rededicating. Uh, a, a re, I, every time I take the Lord's Supper, I think about that because I think about how we reflect on our sin. We, we, from there, we respond to, to that by, by, um, by worship you know, and by recommitting our lives to better serve the Lord. And a lot of what Christ has done for us, uh, His death on the cross particularly, where he, His body was broken, His blood was shed for us, it, it's... Uh, it's, it has a way of propelling us to, to mission and, uh, and recommitment uh, to Christ. And really, today, chapter 35 is all about recommitment. It's, it's kind of the focal, focal word. It's a call to recommit. It's a call to rededicate our lives to what God has called us to do and be uh, personally in our devotion to the Lord, uh, as well as in our mission uh, in, in light of the great commission that God has given to all of us uh, in uh, in the gospel. And so I, uh, <clears throat> I want to share with you from this chapter uh, just a little bit. Uh, basically, God had told Jacob uh, to go to Bethel. This was even before chapter 34. God had spoken to Jacob about going to Bethel. And Jacob wasn't there. He was in Shechem. He had been there for about 10 years at this point. And uh, it's, it's pretty clear that he's not where he's supposed to be and a lot of where God would have him to be. And because of that, things have went poorly. Uh, last uh, couple weeks ago, like I said, with, with all those things that are going on in his family. Uh, but not only that, there's, there's also some problems in Jacob's own heart. When you get to the end of seeing uh, his sons take vengeance upon these people who abused his daughter, uh, it's, it's really telling when Jacob responds to that situation by saying these, these words. In, cha- in chapter 34, verse 30, Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack, I shall be destroyed, both I and my whole household. Isn't that interesting that Jacob's focus during this time was on himself? It seems a bit weird that he's not moved with deep compassion to his daughter. Maybe he was, but it's really not abundantly clear in his response to uh, to his, his sons that, have, that he's speaking to after this has all happened. It seems like he would have been concerned more about that and, and, for, uh, and for other things, but it's more about him. It's his skin uh, on the line now. It's uh, the possibility of these other peoples that are around that hear about uh, this vengeance that his sons have taken on, these, on this one tribe, and these people coming against him and killing him. And, and so he's worried about his own life. And that's abundantly clear at the end of chapter 34. And Jacob, no doubt, had compromised his faith. Uh, he was not where God told him to go. But now God's, I, I think Jacob's even doubting God's promises on some level. It, because he's, he's not trusting in what God has told him in, in his covenant with him. In that, that he was going to use Jacob and, and his people through Jacob. That God was going to bless the world, and, and there will be nations come from, from, from him. So uh, that's kind of where we are uh, in, in the story at the beginning here. And God is going to speak into that moment. Uh, before I move past that moment, though, I, it's, 
it's clear that this is a low moment in Jacob's life. You know, we talk about, as we went through the book of uh, Genesis, we've seen, you know, ups and downs in, in all of the patriarch's lives, Abraham and Jacob and, and others. And this is one of those moments when, this is a low, this is like, his daughter's been uh, abused uh, by the, this man and, and his sons have killed that man and many other people in this village and, you know, Jacob's going, you know, now they're going to kill me. Uh, it's just things are not good in terms of he and his household. Uh, and and it's, uh, it's an all-time low for him in this passage. And no doubt, I think we kind of uh, can, can ex- we've experienced some low of late in our own day, in this time, uh, in this year, in 2020. We've seen uh, some difficult days. Uh, not, not necessarily because our personal sin, uh, but uh, because of sin in the world. We live in a broken world, and because of that, uh, uh, we've experienced a pandemic that is uh, it's been brutal. It's been brutal on, on my own life. Uh, you know, but what about you? You know, ha- have you experienced, have you gotten this year to a point where you're like, man, this is really getting to me? You know, uh, a couple weeks ago, I remember during a quarantine time for myself and my family, uh, just, just kind of coming to a place where I was like, man, this is kind of, this is rough, you know, uh, anxiety, what, anxiety from just not being able to be, uh, the pastor that God, I feel God's called me to be in terms of caring for people. And, uh, it, it's a time when as, as a pastor, you just feel so helpless to, to really care for people. You know, I, I mean, it's, it's a struggle to even be a pastor, you know, uh, Just to give you a few thoughts of kind of my perspective uh, over these past few weeks and months, uh, you know, as a pastor, I would always go to the hospital when someone was having a surgery or something like that uh, uh, and visit with folks and visit with their family. You know, even this week, uh, Miss Betty Tubbs had a significant surgery, a heart surgery this week, and I wanted to be there for Jack and and uh, and have prayer with him and 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 await the news from the doctor after that procedure and wasn't able to be with him wasn't able to experience that with him and show him that we love him and we care for him it's a difficult thing to not be able to be with people like that and as a pastor that that's heavy for me you know uh, not able to visit elderly people in our church there's a lot of elderly folks in our church that to be honest with uh, I, I don't think they want me to come to their house right now. They just want to be uh, as, as free from any potential uh, transmission of a virus as they can be. And, and some of that is just, uh, there's just a fear of, of this virus. And so uh, there's a desire for me not to come. And there's, there's others that are in the nursing home that I can't even go visit. You know, some of the most, uh, some, some lonely people uh, that are maybe not having a lot, a lot of visits from family because the visits are going to be through a glass window or whatnot and, and not being able to interact with those people and, and love them and just uh, give them a hug, you know, and, and let them know that there's a pastor who's praying for them and cares for them. Uh, it's, it's hard, you know, um, it's hard. And uh, just this past couple of weeks, uh, we have had the blessing of, of children being born into families in our church. And normally it's such an exciting thing to be able to go and, and to give a, a children's Bible to those families in the hospital and, and speak to them and let them know that they're loved, you know, and celebrate with them uh, for God's goodness in this child. And have been able to do that. Uh, it's... Um, it's hard, man. Not not being able to be there with your people and the really high joys and, and some of the difficult uh, lows that they experience, you know. And it it sent me just down a really difficult moment, you know. Uh, even this week, and and like I said during the quarantine time, where I was like, man, what are we even supposed to be doing as a pastor? Like, we can't care for our people. Like, what? Like, what? Um, what? What is? What is this? What's the deal? You know, how, how can I how can I be a pastor during this time? How can I help people know that they're cared for during this time? Other than just calling on the phone, which I've been doing a lot of, but it's a difficult day, and it's a difficult day for not just me. Uh, it's a difficult day for people in our church, and and uh, it's a hard time uh, for us to uh, to be able to love others and care for others well in our church family. And that's, that's hard on uh, me as a pastor. I know it's hard on many of you because you're people who minister to others in our church family. And, and I just, 
I just was really encouraged with this word that God spoke to Jacob. Uh, God spoke to Jacob at a moment when Jacob was really low, brought on by his own sin, no doubt, but a point where he was really low. And God speaks a word to him, and his word is this, arise. He says to Jacob, arise. And not only that, if you look at verse 1, it says, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and dwell there. And we know the word Bethel means the house of God. It's, it's like a, a phrase that means um, it's the God of Be- that, that I met at Bethel is kind of what we saw earlier in, the chap- in chapters before. But, but it's a place to meet with God. And, and so God was simply saying, Hey, arise and come to the place where I will meet with you. Come to my home, my dwelling. Come, come to me. And that's such an encouraging word for people uh, like myself who do struggle sometimes uh, in dealing with uh, the difficulties that we're facing and not being able to care for one another and not maybe, maybe not feeling cared for. Uh, it's a great word for us to know that God is, His word to speak to His people is, Arise and come to me. Arise and come, come to me. In this difficult and dark time where you're facing whatever and, and, and maybe, maybe there's sin in your, own, in your own life that you're struggling with and it's, it's affecting your personal relationship with the Lord and there's, there's a feeling of isolation out of that and God is speaking to you amidst that. As if you're a follower of Jesus, He's speaking to you and He's speaking to everyone. He's saying, hey, listen, arise and come to me because that's the kind of God that He is. He's a good and loving God, and He cares for us, and, and He's an initiator. He's, he's not waiting on, on something uh, to, to happen in addition to this low moment to get you to a higher place where you can meet with Him. No, no, no. He's a God who goes to the lowest and the darkest of places and says, Arise and come to Me. And that's good. That's a good, encouraging word for us uh, today and every day to be reminded of. Uh, I think this whole chapter is about that. It's about saying, arise and come to me, to Jacob. But it's also about saying to anyone, anywhere, come back to the Lord. Arise and come back to me. God is saying that. It's a word of recommitment. It's a, how, how do you do that? How do you come back to the Lord if that's the case? If that's your heart right now as you're watching, how do I do that? How do I come back to the Lord? I think we're going to see that as we read through this chapter, these few verses together, some significant things about how to do that, how that can be, how that can happen in your own life. Uh, God, I believe, is going to speak a word to you to say, hey, come back, recommit, rededicate your life to me. Um, And and I think there's going to be an encouraging word for all of us in that uh, and how to do that as well in these verses. Look with me at verse 2. It says in verse 2, So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, put away the foreign gods that are, that are among you and purify yourselves and change your garments. Three significant phrases, I think, there in verse 2. Uh, Jacob is saying to his household, this is the way that we can come back to the Lord and go back to the place where God dwells. First thing we're going to have to do is put away our foreign gods. Now, these were a little teraphim. Uh, they were household deities, probably, that, that Jacob was talking about here. And we saw them earlier in Rachel when she was sitting on this household God because they also had to do with inheritance as well. And, and so uh, the, they were a part of, of the patriarchal family. And it's at this point that, that Jacob is saying, hey, listen, God wants us to go back to Him, to trust in Him. And, and he's saying, listen, we're going to have to do away with idols. We're going to have to do away with, with and put away uh, these false gods uh, and, so that we can come back and trust wholly in the Lord you know, we think about those idols in that day, but, you know, in, in the here and now, the, the way we understand idolatry is really making anything that more fundamental than God when it comes to our happiness, our meaning in life, and, and our identity. Uh, there's many ways that we uh, can make for ourselves idols and not necessarily have something that's actually a, a physical object. Uh, we can make numerous things uh, fundamental to our happiness and our identity. And, and those things are not always physical things, but those things are definitely I- idols if they're not the Lord, if they're not being identified as Christ followers. And so <clears throat> the word for us this morning, how do we come back to the Lord? Well, the first thing we need to be reminded of is we need to put away idolatry in our lives, in our hearts. 
Uh, I think uh, Romans says it this way. It says, and Paul, Paul writes this, it says, For if you live according to the flesh, or, and, which is a, a way of living for yourself being an idol, um, and fulfilling your happiness and your identity through selfishness and things of this world, he says, If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, if you put to death idolatry, you'll live. That's what Paul is telling us in that passage in Romans, but it's, but it's true of us. Like We have to be intentional. If we're going to arise and go back to the place where we're with the Lord, we're going to have to come to a place where we recognize that we're going to have to repent of sin. We're going to have to turn away from idols in our own lives, in our own hearts. There was one guy who came to church, and every Sunday he would come down the front, and he would speak to the pastor, and he would say, Pastor, this morning I need to rededicate my life to the Lord. Maybe you've, you've uh, heard that language, being in church for, for uh, a long time. In, in the past, that was pretty typical. We need, I need to rededicate my life. And, and, uh, and so this fellow was doing that. He was coming every Sunday. And every Sunday, it was the same thing that he would say to the pastor, Listen, pastor, I need to rededicate my life. Lord, uh, I need to ask the Lord to clean out the cobwebs in my heart. Every Sunday, the next Sunday, Lord, I need to clean out the cobwebs of my heart, and I need, I, need you to, I need you to pray that for me, Pastor, and pray with me about how I can clean out the cobwebs in my own heart. As the pastor did, he prayed with him every single week. You know, God, clean, out, clean this man's heart. Help this man to be, to be rededicated in, to you. And, and uh, uh, Until finally, we, after weeks, after weeks, after weeks of coming and saying the same thing, the pastor said, listen, I'm going to pray for you. And he began to pray, and this is how he prayed. He said, God... Kill the spider that's making these cobwebs in this man's heart. Like, like the, the reality is, like, we have to be intentional, not just to kill maybe or modify our behaviors, but, but the deal is for us to really uh, come back to the Lord. We're going to have to cut deep into the, deep in our hearts and into the roots of pride and selfishness that are there in our hearts so that we can come back to the Lord. So we can enjoy the presence of God afresh and anew uh, because the reality is we're just modifying our behaviors. We're going to go back to those same tendencies and those same behaviors. But, but if we cut away and we, and, and we do real heart change and we change the things that we're even treasuring, the Bible says that, that I, I believe the Bible makes it clear that lasting change happens through the heart because the Bible makes it clear that where your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And so it's a treasuring problem. It's a deep problem. And God has to work deeply and surgically take out those sinful desires even so that we can replace those desires, that Holy Spirit can replace those desires with new life-giving desires that find their happiness and delight in Jesus. And so I, I would encourage you, uh, the first word to come back to the Lord is to, is, to, is, is to see ourselves rightly, is to put away that sin that's in our life, deal with sin. That's the first part of, of rededicating and recommitting our lives to Christ. But, but beyond that, verse 3 says this, Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God Listen to who this God is. Who answers me in the day of my distress and has been with me wherever I've gone. Two things we learn about God. And, and this is Im imperative. If we're going to come back to God, we need to remember who the Lord is. We need to remember who He is. Not only deal with our sin, but also remember who God is. And the first thing that He reminds us of in this passage about God is that this is a God who answers me in the day of my distress. This is a God who is faithful to me. That's why Jacob is making abundantly clear. Uh, though Jacob's not been faithful uh, in his past, he is saying that God is different from him. That though he's unfaithful, God is always faithful. Though he, though he is, is anxious and, and though he is doubting God's promises, it is God who is faithful and always answers and comes through on His promises. The, the, this passage is indicative of the whole of the Bible. The whole of the Bible is about a God who, who makes promises. Even as early as Genesis chapter 3, we see God making a promise to, to crush the head of the serpent. That one day, through the seed of the woman, there's going to be one come who will crush the head of the serpent. And we know that there were prophets who were sent. We remember, I reflect on Mark 12, where it talks about the parable of the tenants. And Jesus was telling this parable to show that God has been faithful to His people. 
who were unfaithful. And he sent prophets of old, and he sent prophets, and, uh, and day after day, and time after time that he sent those prophets, the response was that the people would re- eventually reject those prophets, and they would kill them, and, uh, and, and they would become unfaithful again. And then this, this one who is over, the, over this vineyard says, listen, I'm going to send my own son, and maybe they'll listen to him. But the reality is they don't. God sent His Son Jesus to come to this earth and actually put on flesh and blood and so He could sympathize with us in every way. And the Bible says He was rejected and that they took Him up upon Calvary's, uh, the hill of Golgotha and killed Him on Calvary's cross. You see, despite all of that, even the rejection of the Son, God is still faithful. Because God knew that through the death of His Son, He could, even through the death of His Son, provide a way for sinful people to be made right with God. You see, sinful people can't make themselves right with God. We, we, they couldn't fix their own problem that they had in, becoming, in, go, in, in entering into the presence of God again because they were sinful. But God knew a way for sinful people to be made right with God, and that is to deal with sin once and for all at Calvary's cross for those who would repent and believe so that they could have their sins forgiven and so that they could be robed with the righteousness of Jesus that He earned in living a sinless life. You see, God is faithful even in the unfaithful deed of of the death of His Son that that people committed, uh, that that humanity rejected the Son and, and killed Him. And even in that unfaithfulness, God was willing to, sh- to make a way uh, for those unfaithful people to be made right with God and to receive His own faithfulness that He earned in, in Jesus' sinless life. It's an amazing thing to think about the faithfulness of the Lord. Uh, I think about this passage in chapter 35, and one of the things I don't think a lot of people realize is that Jacob's in his latter years. Jacob was somewhere around the age of 120 at this time, 130 at the end of, uh, at the end of our passage. And the Bible is, is kind of, I think it's significant that, that he's older. And we're, we're talking about recommitment, you know, recommitting ourselves to the Lord. And we're talking about that in Jacob's life at an older age. You know, some people will say, well, well, maybe some younger folks need to recommit, but not us older folks, you know. You would never say that if you knew how old Jacob was at this point, right? Because he's older than everyone, else, everyone listening to this, uh, I'm pretty sure, even virtually. So, so uh there was a commentator who was writing about that, and he was writing about, uh, you know, particularly to the audience of senior adults. And he said, you, senior adults are people who have seen the faithfulness of God longer than anybody else. Senior adults are people who, who look back on their life, and they say they can see God's hand at work, and they can say God was true to His Word at every step of the way. God has blessed me so that now in the latter years of my life, I can look back and say, God is good. One theologian said that, and he was talking about that, and he says, there are some people who in their old age are perfectly miserable and others who are perfectly delightful. The difference in, uh, in those folks is in their relationship to God. Some look back on their life and are filled with bitterness. Typically they think things like, so-and-so mistreated me when I, was, when I almost had an opportunity that I really wanted, was about to get, uh, so-and-so took it away from me. And I can never forgive so-and-so because they did this to me. <clears throat> but there are other people who say of the past, well, the past is the past. And I'm not going to worry about the slights of life that happened to me in years past. I'm going to pr- make myself occupied. I'm going I'm to preoccupy myself with all the wonderful blessings that I've received all throughout my life from the Lord talking about His goodness to them. There are people who think about things like, well, so-and-so became a Christian after much prayer. I remember praying for that person and them, them coming to know the Lord. It took so many years, but God did it, and God is faithful. There are people who, who say things like, man, God taught me through the difficult, some of the most difficult parts of my life. I can see and look back and know that God was teaching me and helping to mold me in to someone who would look more like Him, even in those difficult moments that I didn't understand what was going on. God worked, and He achieved good through even those moments in my life. 
you know, the question I think that, that comes to this commentator is he's writing this, and a lot of this comes from uh, James Montgomery Boyce, and, and he kind of sums it up with a couple of application questions. He says, what kind of older person are you going to be? Are you going to be in the sunset years? Are you going to be people who are bitter? Or are you going to be people who are delightful, <laughs> who are joyful? When your children speak of you, are they going to speak of you as someone who is constantly in fear and, and reminiscing on, on things, act, things that happened in the past that were, that were difficult or bad? Or are they going to see people who, who are speaking of, of God's goodness and they're speaking of their, how they're trusting in this God who is good. And even in the bad situations, they have a good God that they can delight in in the present. Will theirs be a legacy? Will yours be a legacy of commitment to the Lord? Or will it be a legacy of commitment to the world and yourself? You know, I, uh, uh, I was thinking a lot about that. And uh, I think, you know, we do see God's faithfulness in this passage. And, and you know, it's important as we recommit our lives to Christ to think about how we have put away sin and we also uh, see God's faithfulness. But we see something else as well in this, in this passage. It says this, uh, not only does it say, He answers me in my distress, but also, listen to what it says, God has been with me wherever I have gone. In other words, God is present. God is um, with His people I think about Psalm 23, and, and you know, I mentioned this earlier, how we can be in the low points when, when we're in the valley of the shadow of death. That's how the psalmist describes it in chapter 23. And the Bible says of our God that He is with us even in that valley. We have a God who is, who is with us. He has is, he is not abandoned us. In, in the moment of difficulty, in the moment when we feel, and every, our circumstances are saying that we're, we've been abandoned by the Lord, we can rest assured that that's not true because God's Word says He is with us in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. God is with us as a pastor. I'm going to fail you. I'm not going to be able to be there. There's going to be regulations that will keep me from being uh, a good pastor to you in some of your difficult moments. But there is a God who will not be limited by regulation. He is a God who will be with you in every single valley you face. In verse 4 through 7, it says this. It says, So they gave to Jacob all these foreign gods. In other words, the family was doing that. They were putting, putting these gods, uh, putting them out of their life. And the, these rings that, that were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under this tree that was near Shechem. And as they, they journeyed, a, a terror from God fell upon the cities that were around them so that they did not pursue the sons of Jacob. In other words, God was going to take care of Jacob. And though he was doubting and thinking he was, that, that his life was in jeopardy, it's God who comes through and protects Jacob and his family. It's God who's faithful to those promises that he's made to make a nation out of Jacob's Jacob and his family. It says in verse 6, And Jacob came to Luz, that's Bethel, that's where it is, which is in the land of Canaan, he and all the people who were with him. And there he built an altar, and he called that place El Bethel, because there God had revealed himself to him when he fled from his brother. That word El Bethel, it's different from what we've seen in the usage of the word up to this point. It's, it's not Spanish where it's like, the, the house of God. <laughs> That's not what's going on there. This, this passage is talking about how this place, th this location is not about a place. It's not about a, an altar. It's about God being in that place. In fact, in Genesis 28, we saw that this place, Bethel, was, was talked about this way. It says in chapter 28, verse 16 and verse 17, it says, Surely the Lord is in this place. And then elsewhere it says, how awesome is this place? The emphasis is on a place. <laughs> but here, the emphasis, because he uses that phrase, El Bethel, it's, the emphasis is on the person. It literally means God of the house of God. Man, that's so cool, isn't it? That, that as Jacob's thinking about rededicating and recommitting his life to God, and he's, he and his family are putting away these household deities, and they're, they're moving toward this play, the house of God. It's not about the house of God, though, for him. It's about God of the house of God. 
Listen, friend, we don't need to, it's not that you need to start going to church necessarily. That's not necessarily what all this is about. It's about being with God. And certainly church is a part and, and a part of that picture. But the, the reality is that it's not about a place that we go. It's about a God that we know. And, and, and if you're watching this, man, the, the way to come back to the Lord is to not come back to a, a, maybe a thing in the past or, 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 or a, a place, a location uh, that you've been to when you were really close to God. It's not about any of that. Listen, it's about coming back to the person of God. Coming back to, to the God whom obviously all of us on some way or another have, have, have been away from in some ways. And repenting of our sin and coming back to Him is what this passage is all about. Certainly, there's a verse in verse 8 where it talks about Deborah passing away. And then in verse 9, uh, we learn something else. Uh, we, we've said God is uh, a God who is, who is uh, faithful and who's present. But look what it says in, in these verses about God. It says, God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padan Haram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I'll give to you, and I'll give the land to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him, and Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the place where God had spoken with him Bethel. Interesting that not only do we know that God is faithful and that He's present, but one of the things that God says about Himself in this passage he says, I am God Almighty. The word is El Shaddai. We've already seen it uh, before this. Uh, but the phrase here, El Shaddai, is used. I am God Almighty. And, and no doubt there's some covenant language here. There's phrases that we've seen before. Be fruitful and multiply. That's a phrase we've seen in the context of this covenant relationship that God has with His people. As well as some things like, a nation shall come from you. Or, I will give to you this land. That, those kind of phrases have already been seen. God is a covenant-making God. He's covenanted with a people. And He said, hey look, I'm going to bless this people. And I'm going to use this people to show all people how good and gracious that I am. And, and so he's, he's covenanted with a people. And this is covenant language. But listen, covenant language is meaningless if God is not God Almighty. And God says of Himself that that is exactly who He is. <clears throat> that God is powerful. That He's Almighty. That He's in control of all things. That, that He is powerful to accomplish anything. That He is able that there's not things that he can't do. There's no, there's no depth of, of, of sorrow or, or depth of, of hurt that you've experienced, nor a valley that you're in right now, that God can't come to that place and he is not able to comfort and encourage you amidst that dark place that you may be in. And so I, I think as we think about rededicating our lives to the Lord, we ought to think intentionally about the God who is faithful, the God who is present, and the God who is able. And I think we see those characteristics of God most fully in Jesus, don't we? We see that it's Jesus who is faithful to come to this earth and live the sinless life that we could never live. We see that it's Jesus who's present uh, in, on this earth so that He can sympathize with us in our every weakness. We see that it's Jesus who is able not just to die for our sin, but to rise from the grave to give us hope and forgiveness for our sin and make a way for us to never experience that isolation and loneliness uh, in a forever that will be spent with Him in glory on a new earth, enjoying a new manifestation of His presence that is near to us. Man, I want to tell you, friend, if you are away from the Lord, man, come back. Recommit your life to the Lord. 
Read, make this a day when, when, when you're, whatever day it is that you watch this, this, uh, this recording, I want to encourage you and I want to I pray that God would indeed help you to come back to Him. If you're a person who's watching this and you'd say, man, I've never committed my life to Christ, my word to you would be commit your life to Jesus. Put away sin, repent of your sins, and turn to Jesus. And you'll find one in Christ who is faithful who is faithful to you along the way of life that is difficult and hard at times, who is present with you and will not abandon you in your dark moments, and who's able, who is almighty, who's capable of of not only being with you in those moments, but promising and making a way for you to never be in those moments ever again in an eternity spent with Him. That is a God who's able, and that is our God. And that is our God in Christ. And I hope and my prayer is that if you're watching this, that this would be a day where either you commit your life to Christ for the first time or from this moment on, you recommit your life to making His glory known in this world, to being a person who is a better image bearer to the world that we live in, to a person who's more devoted personally in prayer and in Scripture reading so that you can know God better and be a greater witness in the days ahead so that your life will be lived for the mission for which God has called all of His people to make much of the name of Jesus in this world so that people from every tribe, tongue, and nation can know this Jesus personally and can know one day a God who will be all seen in His His glory as present and faithful and almighty uh, in light of all the circumstances that we face in this world. It is good to know. Uh, that there is coming a day when we will, we will know that in an experiential way all the more when we go to be with the Lord in glory. I pray that, that you know Him, uh, know Jesus as your Savior, and uh, that you uh, are a part of His faith family, and that this will be a day where you can dedicate your life afresh and anew uh, to Christ and what God has called you to be in the days ahead.